Good evening. <laughs> Good to have you with us. We're always glad to know that there are some people who want to be instructed. People who don't like the idea of believing that the policemen are the protector of the people and firemen by the same token. Although I will grant you, firemen and policemen have certain duties which are at times very helpful to the average citizen. But uh, I'm not speaking of these oddball times. After all, how many times in your life have you ever been held up on the streets? How many times have you been stopped in your car by a highwayman? How many times can you say that you have actually been in need of a policeman? Very few, I offer, and I think you will concur. And uh, we are entitled, I think, to a little explanation as to how these people spend their days. Now, when was the last time you looked at a cop and you looked him from head to toe and you thought, uh, geez, I'm in better shape if I try to protect myself? Let us face it, there are a lot of cops with completely gray heads, guys who are just about five or three or two years away from their pensions and they can do nothing. If, uh, as they say in the comic books, quote, a desperado, unquote, was to confront them, they'd shit in their pants and probably get their gray head shot off. I mean, we can do without this thing. If we're going to have a police force, let us live up to the word police. To police means to keep in order, to protect. There are old, gray-looking bastards guys that couldn't even protect themselves, much less you and me, patrolling the streets under the pretense of being policemen. This is shameful, really. Now, frankly, I could care less about the police department itself, but I just don't like the fact that we are being fooled. We are supposed to believe that the police department is here to protect us. These guys are pretty stupid. Firemen are no better than cops. Next time you go to a fire, don't watch the fireman who is carrying the hose or swinging the axe. Don't watch those guys. Those guys obviously have things to do. Keep your eye on the fireman that doesn't seem to have too much to do because the odds are after that guy who has not too much to do has been in your parlor... 20 minutes, he's got half of the small articles of your parlor in his pocket. That's right. Firemen are pretty close to being as dishonest as the average dirty goddamn cop. Your dirty, stupid policeman that can't even work in the A&P. He's got to be a cop. You know what I mean? Don't trust them. Well, first of all, we all know from birth that we don't trust cops. And we all know some of the tricks of policemen. We all know how they will pull their badge on you and give you a bad time. We know that cops are basically full of shit because you can tempt and taunt the average cop and he'll give up. Okay? We know this. Okay. You can never expect to get a fair shake from anything that is involved with government. There is nobody who has ever run a government who has ever been fair and righteous. Don't ever leave yourself open to these people because they're dirty. <laughs> That's a funny word, dirty. That's very basic. But they are. They're dirty and they're no goddamn good. In America, people answer to each other. There are very few individuals left in America. I happen to believe that I am one of them. You may think you are one of them. An individual is a person who thinks and acts for himself. Now, there are a lot of people who think for themselves. 
A lot of people who think for themselves, boy, they're great. They watch Marlboro commercials or Chesterfield or something, and they say, boy, I'm a man, I think for myself. But thinking for yourself doesn't make you an individual. No. No, sir. In order to be an individual, you must not only think for yourself, you must plan for yourself. And you must plan ahead, and you must live up to these plans. You must know exactly what you want to do. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome George Carlin! Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate that. When did this country turn into a nation of rats and squealers? Have you noticed this? Last 10, 15 years, rats and squealers and snitches. People spying on each other, turn each other in, call them the tipster hotline. If you see a crime, call the tipster hotline. Let me tell you something. It's not the tipster hotline. It's the rats and squealers hotline. But if they called it that, you know how many people would use it? Yeah, lots of them. Because people have no principles anymore. We're living in a nation of stool pigeons. How am I driving? Call 1-800 and squeal on the truck driver. Sounds like a small thing, but it's not. It's an open invitation to be a rat. And that's what people are turning into. They cooperate with prosecutors, for Christ's sakes. Prosecutors, the worst kind of dishonest swine ever to crawl out of the devil's asshole. <laughs> just the worst fucking humans and people make deals with them they plea bargain they betray their friends just to stay out of jail that's what happened to those poor guys in the mafia they sold each other out shit when i was a kid we looked up to the mafia we admired and respected those guys because they had a code of silence no one talked ever now they squeal on each other make a book deal buy a fake mustache and move to pocatello idaho you know something? They deserve fucking Pocatello, Idaho. And speaking of places where people blow cows, let me ask you a question. I got a question. You remember those militia assholes? You remember those patriotic nitwits said they didn't recognize the authority of the federal government? They had a flag with a serpent on it said, don't tread on me. Well, the flag should have said, don't squeal on me, because first chance they got, two of them testified for the government against their friends just to stay out of jail. Never mind the serpent. You know what that flag should have had on it? A rat. A nice, big, brown, diseased sewer rat fucking the serpent in the ass. And both of them wearing camouflage fatigues. We got no heroes anymore in this country. There's no heroes. Timothy Leary turned in people to the FBI. Elvis Presley was a snitch for the DEA. The only hero I've seen recently was Susan McDougal. She told Ken Starr to go get fucked, and she went to jail for two years for it. That's what I call being a hero. And by the way, Clinton must have thrown her a pretty good hump to get loyalty like that, don't you think so? Yeah? Huh? Good for her. Good for her, and good for him. I'm glad he got away with everything he got away with. And the worst part of this snitch shit is these people who squeal on their families. You know, parents spying on their kids, searching their rooms for drugs, and the kids are no better. Did you ever read about one of these dumbass kids turns his parents in for having some drugs in the house? Shit, how stupid can you get? You don't turn in the people who are buying the food, asshole. <laughs> Think it through. Squealing on your family. Theodore Kaczynski, the Unabomber, one of my personal heroes, by the way. You bet your ass. He was turned in by his own brother. You don't do that. You don't turn in your brother or your parents or your kids, no matter what they're doing, even if they're selling drugs and killing people. Whatever happened to family values? In fact, you should never cooperate with the police ever at any time for any reason. Fuck the police. Fuck the police. Let them solve some crimes on their own. They rely too much on jailhouse snitches, unsolved mysteries, and America's most wanted to get other people to solve their crimes. They turn good citizens into vigilantes and bounty hunters, lower than a snake's ball bag. 
The mafia knew how to handle squealers in the old days. When I was a kid, there was a famous bank robber by the name of Willie Sutton. Everybody loved Willie. He was running from the police, you know. And one day he's riding a subway in New York City, and a private citizen, some civic-minded prick named Arnold Schuster, spotted Willie and turned him into the police. But Albert Anastasia, a mafia boss, read about it in the newspapers, and he had Arnold Schuster killed, which is just what the yellow rat motherfucker deserved. <laughs> You don't help the police. When I was a kid and we went to the movies, we rooted against the police. Against the police and for the crooks. And I still do. I love the crooks. I don't give a shit if they come to my house and kill my entire family. I'm on their side. I'd rather spend 16 hours stuck in an elevator with a couple of crooks than even say hello to a fucking policeman. You don't help the police. They're not on your side. Don't you understand this shit yet? They work for the state. They'll plant fake evidence. They'll put a loaded gun in the hands of an unarmed man they've shot to death. They harass minorities. They brutalize people. They deny people their rights. And they lie about it all in court all the time. They perjure themselves routinely. But they don't squeal on each other. They're not rats. So take a page from their book, but never ever help them. And above all, don't plea bargain by turning in a friend. Tell you what, some of you religious people out here, you religious folks, on judgment day, when you see God, ask him if you can plea bargain. Ask him if you turn in your family, will he let you into heaven? You know what he'll say? He'll say, go to hell. He'll say, go to hell, you fucking squealing prick. Because even God hates a rat. You know what Jesus should have done? He should have beat the shit out of Judas. Just grabbed him by the beard and beat the shit out of him. Right in front of the other apostles. Make an example out of him. You fucking squealing prick, Judas, you cocksucker. You realize I could turn you into a fucking pillar of salt if I want? Turn you into a fucking monkey. How is I can be a fucking monkey? Where's the money? Where's the fucking $30? Give me the $30. I'm fucking buying beer for the rest of these guys. Because they didn't fucking rat on me, you prick. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. <laughs> You know why? You know why he didn't do that? Because he believed in all this goofy love bullshit. But you notice something else. He did not plea bargain with the Romans. And he didn't squeal on the apostles, you know? He kept his big fucking yap shut, and he took what was coming to him. We can all learn something from Jesus. Even if it's not what we're expecting. Thank you. I appreciate that, folks. Excuse my allergy, but it's a better reason for blowing my nose on stage than I used to have. <laughs> and a lot less expensive. Well, after a while, you do kind of grow up, you know? You realize that, well, a couple of lines of cocaine make you feel like a new man. Problem is, first thing the new man wants, a couple of lines of cocaine. You know? <laughs> so it's like looking in the barbershop mirror. Now, here's something that bothers me. Surprise. When I'm flying first class and some guy from coach comes up and takes a shit in our bathroom, you know? Don't you hate that? I say, get back to your filthy coach toilet with the tampon sticking out of the commode. And don't be coming up here and trying to upgrade your feces. Your super saver feces. Well, I think most people know by now, caviar feces smell much nicer than bologna sandwich feces. It's unfortunate, you don't like to tell people the truth, you don't want to point out class distinctions, but it's true, it's a function of socioeconomics. It's called the fecal differential. It has to do with diet as it relates to income. The lower the income, the worse the diet, the more disgusting the feces. And the same thing applies to farts, and the worst farts of all, the most horrendous farts in the whole travel experience can be found in the economy section of any plane coming in from the third world. It is fucking torture back there, folks. Underdeveloped country farts. Those people have farts that could kill cancer. The kind of fart that comes in handy if you have something that needs welding. The kind of fart that if you let one go at home, 30 minutes later, your plants are all yellow. The kind of fart that after two or three days, you realize there are no more birds in your neighborhood. A fart that would eat the stitching out of Levi's. Can I get away with one more fart joke here? The kind of fart whereby the Centers for Disease Control declares your pants a level five biohazard. 
And what happens is, in these third world flights, in the economy section, about an hour after the meal service, they quite often have these life-threatening fart emergencies. The FAA calls them TFIs, toxic flatulence incidents. The airlines call them code browns. Just as a hospital has a code blue, airlines have code brown, code brown. <laughs> if you ever hear that, do not inhale. You are in a code brown. And the worst place to be is in the last three rows. Because what happens is these planes get flying so fast that all the most vicious, lethal, volatile, flammable, unstable farts get pushed toward the back of the airplane where they begin to build up pressure. And they build and they build and they build until they reach critical fart density, CFD. And they continue to build throughout the flight until finally some kid turns on a Game Boy and boom. The whole back end of the plane blows off. And you know who gets blamed? Osama bin Laden. <laughs> Terrorists get blamed for these explosions that are nothing more than cabbage fart detonations. And the FBI doesn't know. FBI doesn't know what to do. They're looking for explosives. They should be looking for minute traces of rice and bok choy. <laughs> these are the kind of thoughts that kept me out of the really good schools and prevented me from moving swiftly up the corporate ladder. Because I was always complaining about something, you know? Always finding fault. You know something I'm getting tired of? Songs. There's too many fucking songs. It's all you ever hear, songs. You know how many songs there are? Okay, every year 25,000 CDs come out, okay? 25,000. So even if you throw out half the titles and say they're old songs being re-recorded, and you stay very conservative and you say, well, eight songs to a CD, that's still 100,000 songs every year. Every year, and that's just this country. There's about 185 other countries out there, all of them pumping out songs. Probably not a lot of snappy tunes coming out of Rwanda these days, <laughs> but some, there's gotta be some. I'm telling you, it adds up. I'll bet you anything that if you counted every song Every song ever written in the history of the world, in every culture since the beginning of time, by now, there's got to be 10 million songs. 10 million songs. They're not enough. Don't we have enough fucking songs for you people? You're telling me you're standing in the shower and with 10 million songs out there, you can't think of something to sing? You got to have a new song? And they're all love songs. It's all you ever hear is a fucking love song. Can't somebody write a song about something else? Everything's a broken heart, broken heart, broken heart. Fuck that. What about a fractured cheekbone? How about a punctured lung, huh? Wouldn't you like to see some good-looking chick with long hair and big tits standing up on stage singing about a punctured lung? Would sure make my fucking weekend. No one is writing these songs. How about a song about a fire in a nursing home? Huh? All right, a daycare center. Okay, a church. A crowded church. How about a song about a guy who gets his legs caught in a wood chipping machine? Here's a nice song. Family of four comes home from vacation at Disney World and finds 27 bodies decomposing in the living room. And they all have on Santa Claus suits. I'm telling you, we're passing up a lot of really good topics that would make terrific fucking songs. Like cancer. I know it's touchy. Fuck you. Cancer would make a really great song. Shit, everybody's got cancer. Nobody's singing about it. Here is a market niche being deliberately overlooked. And by the way, tuberculosis is coming back too. Here's another musical opportunity. Wouldn't you like to hear a song with a whole lot of coughing in it? You never hear these kind of songs. You never hear that. Everything's a love song. It's always emotional pain. You know, you know something? The last thing I'm interested in is someone else's emotional pain. Don't be singing about your pain. Unless it's cancer pain. You could do a whole CD. First cut is cancer. Second cut, tuberculosis. Three and a half minutes, solid coughing. Starts out slow with the introduction to the song. Guy's just clearing his throat. <laughs> then you go to the first verse. <laughs> kind of a dry cough, non-productive. You get in the second verse, the song begins to build. Now you're in the chorus and the guy's coughing louder and louder and harder and harder and he's choking and gasping and wheezing and panting and you can hear the fluids in his lungs and he's doubled over and he's running out of breath and finally gets into one big, huge, uncontrollable, spasmodic coughing fit and he gags and pukes all over the microphone. That would be the climax to the song. And maybe you could make it interactive with a CD-ROM and the guy could puke right into your living room. Huh? Yeah, you probably need special speakers for that. 
I don't know, I'm not into the technical stuff. I'm more of an idea man. I'm a concept guy. You know what I am? I'm a visionary. I'm a fucking visionary. I'm always thinking about something. I'm always fucking thinking. Especially when I'm alone, you know? Now you're probably saying to yourselves, what the fuck does this guy think about when he's alone? If this is the shit he's willing to talk about in public, what kind of garbage floats through his head when he's home? Well, I'm gonna tell you. It's a fair question, I'll tell you what I think about. You know what I think about when I'm alone? The first enema. Huh? Yeah. I don't think about it all the time, you know. But a lot. Maybe 30, 40 times a day. That's not too much, is it? I don't dwell on it. It's just a quick thought. But let me ask you this. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about the first enema? No. You know why? No vision. No fucking vision. Me, I'm a visionary. I'm always thinking about something, you know? That's when I thought about the first enema. Here's how it happened. Me and my friend were giving each other an enema, you know? What, he's my friend. Leon, hey, what good is a friend if he can't give you an occasional enema, huh? So me and Leon are giving each other an enema this day, and uh, at this particular point, it was my turn, so I was kind of relaxed, you know? I was draped over the end of the living room couch there, and I'm reading the food section of the newspaper, always looking for a good veal recipe, you know? I'm looking through there, and we're talking back and forth, me and Leon, we're talking about hockey, we're talking about the NASDAQ, we're talking about how sometimes if you rub your eyes real hard, you can see kind of a checkerboard pattern, you know? And suddenly, out of the blue, I turn to Leon. Well, I couldn't turn all the way around. But over my shoulder, I says, hey, Leon, I wonder whoever came up with the first enema. Well, he flipped. He had never thought of such a thing. He practically dropped the equipment he was holding. And that thing is heavy. It's a fire hose. Number 12 with a zoom nozzle but it leaves you feeling really refreshed. So we started talking about the first enema because when you think about it, there had to be a first enema. There had to be a first one. Everything has to happen once for the first time. Some guy, some guy, just sitting there had to think of the enema. And I'm sure it was a guy. This does not sound like a lady's thought. Some guy, he's a long time ago, this guy, probably making spear tips or some shit, sitting there carving a fertility fetish for his girlfriend, something like that. Suddenly, he thinks to himself, you know something, I think it would be a really great idea if I would squirt a whole bunch of water up my ass. And then just let it all run out. I'll bet I would feel a whole lot better if I did that. And then, after he thought of it, dig this. After he thought of it, he had to explain it to the other people <laughs> and test it. Something like that, you're gonna wanna test it. You probably wanna test it on someone else. I'm sure you wouldn't try it on yourself. <laughs> but wouldn't you have to be subtle? Don't you think you need kind of a subtle approach? Hey, Joey, turn around, I got a surprise for you. <laughs> now turn around, whoops, I dropped my rock. Would you pick it up for me, please? Oh, thank you. Hold still. <laughs> okay, relax. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath, Joey. Through your mouth, please. No, through your mouth, Joey, please. These are new shoes. Okay, relax. It's a new thing, Joey. It's called the enema. Yeah, I thought up today during lunch. That's right, I had the veal. Tell the truth, Joey. Did you like it a little bit, huh? Yeah, I kind of got a kick out of it myself. You want to go again? Ah, I'm only kidding you. I wouldn't blame you if you didn't want to. That was pineapple juice and sand. Joey, guess what? We're engaged. <laughs> I'm only kidding you. Look, I gotta go home and wash off my legs. I'll see you at the dance, okay? Some guy, some guy had to think of it. How? Why? Why would it even enter your fucking mind? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you, because the guy was thinking big. The guy was a visionary. Probably made a fortune. It's a big business now. Colonic irrigation, they call it. Big in California, everybody in that state squirting something up somebody's ass and getting paid for it. 
You know what I'm waiting for? Enemas online. <laughs> Electronic digital enemas. They'll have it, you watch. Some guy's home tonight. E.nema.com slash pineapple juice. Some visionary's home tonight trying to get a mouse in his ass. Probably a Macintosh guy, you know? So we're always ahead of the curve, yeah. Good ideas, good fucking ideas. As usual tonight, I've been doing a lot of complaining, a lot of criticizing, and uh, people seem to like that. I thought maybe by now, you might be ready to hear about something I like. Would you want me to tell you about something I really, really like, huh? Fatal disasters. <laughs> Big fatal disasters with lots of dead people. Because I kind of like it when a lot of people die. Some people like macrame, some people like doing the mambo. Me, I like a nice train wreck. Fire in a paint factory, you know? Ship going down, plane blowing up. 500 guys trapped in a mine with no air, no water, and one little box of junior mints. I like that, it's exciting. To me, anything that kills a lot of people is exciting. You know the best thing I can hear on television? We interrupt this program. You know the worst thing I can hear? No one was hurt. Ah, shit, no one was hurt. I get depressed, you know? Because I'm always rooting for a really high death toll. That's why I like the natural disasters, the big natural disasters that no one can control. Tornado, hurricane, earthquake. Tornadoes are great because there's hardly any warning, you know? So you can get in there and fucking nail some people in their sleep. Another nice thing about a tornado, no one can find their cat. <laughs> Which I think is fucking interesting. Then you got a hurricane. Hurricane is completely different because there's a lot of warning. So unfortunately, you don't get the really nice high fatality numbers. But on the bright side, it lasts a longer time and you do get widespread property damage, which is always a good thing. Another nice thing about a hurricane, sometimes it'll change direction, you know? They come in, they hit one city, boom, hit a fucking city. Then they lose strength and you get discouraged. So they go back out over the ocean, pick up strength, they come back, boom, nail another fucking city. So it's kind of like two for the price of one. Weather-wise, it's a good value. Now, earthquakes. You would think with an earthquake, here is a golden opportunity to put up some really big numbers. Fatality-wise, property-wise, it seems like it's a win-win situation all the way around. Trouble with these earthquakes is they never seem to hit downtown in a big city. And they're awfully weak. Have you noticed how weak these earthquakes in America, out in California, these people, they get an 8.5, a 9.7. You know, it's pussy stuff. You know what they need in California? A nice big boom, fucking 29. Yeah, boom. Big powerful fucking 29 there. Big city downtown rush hour. 10 years of aftershocks. Aftershocks averaging 18.6. No, 23.5. Give these laid back assholes something to talk about on the beach while they're waiting for the Red Cross to come and pick them up. I like all that shit. Tidal wave, volcano, monsoon, forest fire, avalanche, a famine, huh? Come on, you can't beat a fucking famine. First of all, with a famine, you get to see Sally Struthers on television a whole lot more. But the best thing about a famine is it lasts a long time, sometimes more than one generation. So you could wind up with a couple of million dead motherfuckers, you know? To me, you can never have too many dead people. That's why, you know what my favorite disaster would be? And Jesus, I pray for one of these. An asteroid. A big fucking asteroid. And I mean big, never mind this shit that destroyed the barn. I'm talking about a big hunk of rock the size of Minnesota. A flaming asteroid the size of Minnesota screaming through the atmosphere and smashing right into boom. Hey, Minnesota, huh? What the fuck? You can never have too many dead people. And I don't care who gets killed. I don't care who it is. As long as it's not me. Or someone close to me. Although to tell you the truth, if it's a nice big disaster, something good, the people close to me are on their own. Fuck them. It's not my responsibility. And I know what you're thinking, you're saying, well, that's all very cute and clever, George, but you'd feel a whole lot different if one of your loved ones ever got killed. And I think, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> Not really, maybe it'd be a little less fun than usual, but as long as a lot of other people died, I'd be fine. I'd get over it, because I really like big disasters. And I'm always hoping things get worse, you know? I'm always hoping, no matter what the original problem is, it leads to bigger and bigger complications that get completely out of control. Like if a downtown water main breaks in a big western city and it floods out an electrical substation, causing a power failure that knocks out all the traffic lights, creates a citywide traffic jam, and emergency vehicles can't get through, you know? And at the same time, one of those month-long global warming heat waves comes along, but there's no air conditioning and no water for sanitation, so cholera, dysentery, 
smallpox and typhoid fever break out, and thousands of people get infected and start dying in the streets. But before they die, parasites eat their brains. And they, so they storm the hospitals looking for treatment, and the hospitals can't handle all the emergencies. So the infected people start strangling the doctors and stripping off their clothing and lighting it on fire in a big pile in front of the hospital. And the flames drive them even crazier. So they start stabbing social workers and garbage men. And then they light the buildings on fire, and a huge wind comes along, and the entire city begins to burn. And then the people who aren't infected yet, the well people, they get pissed off, and they start beheading and burning at the stake all of the sick people and breaking into their homes and trying on their underwear. Then everybody takes LSD and gets drunk, smokes PCP and crack, and they go completely out of their fucking minds, and they start defecating in the public library. And they march on City Hall and start butt-fucking each other in front of the statue of Samuel Gompers. And at this point, it appears that pretty soon things are going to get out of control. So everybody panics and tries to leave the city at the same time, and they trample each other to death on the highway by the thousands, and their corpses are eaten by wild dogs. And the wild dogs chase the rest of the people down the highway, and they pick off the slow ones and the old ones one by one because they're in the fucking fast lane. And the people, the lucky ones who managed to get all the way out of town, realize when they get there that big sparks from the city have lit the suburbs on fire and the suburbs burn out of control. And thousands of identical homes have identical fires with identical smoke, killing all the soccer moms and guys named Todd. And, and the, the suburbs light the farmlands on fire and the farms burn intensely at 400 degrees, creating millions of baked potatoes. And as the farms burn, the farmhouses and the barns begin to explode from all the hidden methamphetamine labs inside them. And the meth chemicals run down the hill into the streams and rivers where the wild animals drink the water and get completely geeked on speed. And as a result, bears and wolves amped on cranks start roaming around the countryside looking for people to eat, even though they're not really hungry. And the fire spreads to the forest, and the forests burn intensely. And hundreds of trolls and elves and fairies come running out of the woods, screaming, Bambi is dead, Bambi is dead. And he is, he is. Finally, the fucking fruity little Bambi is dead. And now hundreds of regional fires come together into one huge interstate firestorm. And all 12 of the Western United States are burning out of control, except Utah, where the Mormons don't allow fire. And as the firestorm reaches the Midwest, fierce 200 mile an hour winds push it across the Great Plains, toasting the wheat, cooking the cattle, and producing a strange hamburger smell. And now the fires leap the Mississippi and race through the South, destroying trailer parks and killing millions of inbred people. And finally, now the fires turn northeast and head for Washington, D.C., where George Bush can't decide if it's an emergency or not. So the fire goes to Philadelphia, but it's a weekend and Philadelphia is closed. So it goes to New York City and the people in New York tell the fire to go fuck itself. And they do, so instead the fire completely burns down Connecticut and Long Island, killing all the rich white assholes and destroying their evil faggoty golf courses. And while all this is going on, Canada burns to the ground, but nobody notices it. And finally, the entire North American continent is on fire, producing a huge thermal updraft and creating an incendiary cyclonic macrosystem, a hemispheric megastorm that breaks down the molecular structure of the atmosphere and changes the laws of nature. Fire and water combine. Burning clouds of flaming rain fall upwards. Gamma rays and solar winds ignite the ionosphere, creating enormous clouds of ionized plasma. Lightning bolts 10 million miles long start shooting out of the North Pole, and the moon explodes, and outer space begins to vibrate and twist, and suddenly the entire fabric of space-time splits in two. A huge crack in the universe opens and all the dead people from the past begin falling through. Babe Ruth, Tiny Tim, Groucho Marx, Davy Crockett, Hitler, Alan Ludden, Janis Joplin, your Uncle Dave, my Uncle Dave, everybody's Uncle Dave. An endless stream of dead Uncle Dave's falling through the crack and all the Uncle Dave's gather around a huge heavenly kitchen table and light up cigarettes and start talking. They talk about how they never got a break, how their parents didn't love them, how they just missed out on a big job, how ungrateful their children were and how the government screwed them out of money. They say the Jews own everything and the blacks get special treatment and all of the hatred and bitterness drips out of them. A big pool of liquid hate and the pool begins to spin. The hate pool spins round and round faster and faster and it begins to expand at a rapid rate, bigger and bigger until the pool of hate is bigger than the original universe and suddenly it explodes into millions of tiny stars and each star has a million planets and each planet has a million Uncle Daves and all the Uncle Daves have good jobs, perfect eyesight and brand new underwear. They all have shoes that fit perfectly, good medical plans, they all like their neighbors and their favorite teams win the World Series every year and none of them has a hacking cough. And each week, without fail, every one of the Uncle Daves wins the lottery. Every week, forever and ever, until the end of time, Uncle Dave has a winning ticket and Uncle Dave is finally happy. Now do you see why I like it when a lot of people die? There you go. 
All righty. I'll see you later. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have fun. Take care. Be cool. Win money. Thank you. My name is Jerry Hamza. George and I wound up partners and best friends for almost 35 years. I was in the country music business. I had never seen George Carlin, heard of him, everybody else had. My dad had started as a big band promoter. When it got in the mid-60s, I was working with my father full-time. Finally, one day, he came to me and he says, listen, I have a partner that we do country music shows with in Toledo. And he did a comedian and sold out the Masonic Auditorium and the Taft Theater in Cincinnati. He says, I can get Rochester and Syracuse on this guy if you want to do it. I agreed to do George, and we did four shows in two days. And that is how I came to meet George Carlin. I remember this first thing I ever said to him. I said, the Syracuse Herald Journal would like to interview you. And he says, why? Is it my birthday? <laughs> I said, that? I didn't know how to respond to that. We hit it off. I wound up being his manager. Something that maybe you should know about George. George started in the business with a guy named Jack Burns. That was his partner. So it was Burns and Carlin. He was a disaster chaser, and he turned George into a disaster chaser, too. In other words, if they heard that there was going to be a monsoon someplace, Jack, for sure, you know, would be on a plane in half an hour to fly right into the thing so that he could enjoy it. <laughs> you know, So these guys had a little different head. A new album, I kind of like it when a lot of people die. This is something that George came up to me a half a dozen times, I think, uh, feeling me out, you know, because of such a radical title. And, you know, saying, you know, when you read that like 50,000 people died in, you know, India or something, and then it's so disappointing, you know, that it wasn't, Reno, <laughs> you know, he wanted it. He wanted it as close as he could get it. We had an HBO show coming up, I believe, in uh, November. And we had a title, I kind of like it when a lot of people die, and he had the major piece, which was The Closer. I had heard it probably, I don't know, 60 times. And uh, we thought it was going to be cool. HBO had done it great cover, which was uh, wild, and it was very, very different, and uh, we were all set. George had a condo in Las Vegas, and I think we were doing about 12 weeks a year there, and that's where he was on 9-11. I'm at home, and I got a call from my son, Alexander, and he said, did you see what's going on? And I says, no, I have no idea. So I turn it on, and we're watching those very famous pictures of the planes hitting the Twin Towers. I called George, and he's already on it. We didn't know what we were going to do. We assumed that the shows were going to be canceled. About 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we got a call from upstairs saying there's absolutely no shows. And now, if he's not going to do a show at 9 o'clock that night, he wants to get in the car and scoot back to L.A. You remember that movie where uh, Al Pacino was driving blind? Well, let me tell you, as a passenger, you felt that way when George was driving. Nobody, nobody could ever make it from Vegas to West L.A. in less time than George did. So George changed the title. He was great at titles, and he changed it to Complaints and Grievances, and he filed it, and he says, we'll use it someday. It never got used, and it's getting used now. Logan Haftel, who I'm talking to, went through so much of Georgia's material. It's great stuff. It's class A stuff. This was his closer to his HBO show right about the time he was at the prime 
of his career. So this is stuff that we're really proud of. George, I think, would be very happy not to see these pieces wasted, to see people get to hear him. I think he'd be thrilled. I know he was proud of them. He was going to put them on home box office. So I think he'd be very, very happy. And I think the people that listen to this are going to be very, very happy too. I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot about comedy from him. One of the things I learned is that you can't go in and keep an audience up all the time. It's got to have a flow to it. It's got to go up and down, up and down. And if you left them up all the time, you could never sustain it. George had a vulnerability. If somebody was heckling, he'd tell them to go fuck their mother. And the next time he played the show, the same guy would be in the audience. Because of the vulnerability he had, they just would say, oh, that's George. Because it was George, he could do a piece like, I kind of like it when a lot of people die. He could do that. They would accept that from him. And you got to remember, that was one part of a huge body of work. He found a pattern that worked for him. But if you go back and you listen to George's shows or look at George's shows, generally, he'd hit you between the eyes with a one or two strong one-liners. And then he would get you a couple of lighter ones. And then he would do a little philosophical piece. There was something he wanted to say beyond comedy. Then he would go back and he would do some more light stuff and then he would close with the heavy one. You you know, I know in my heart that there's nobody that can replace him in my life. So that's sort of a mixed blessing, isn't it? When I started with George, I was just amazed at how strong his mind was. He could start in the morning at 7 in the morning, and he would just work the whole goddamn day. He could work creatively on building new material morning, noon, and night. I used to, I used to kid him. People used to say, is George around? I'd say he's up in the trees because he didn't want to be around. He wanted to go away and work on his stuff. You know, we were on top, period. Sirius XM, they had their 23 million listeners vote on the best comedians of all time, and uh, George came in first. He's still first. So we must have been doing something right. It seems like it has a life of its own now. It seems that the man has been gone eight years almost, and it keeps going. Isn't that amazing? My name is Rocco Orbisi, a friend, colleague of uh, George Carlin, producer, director of his last 10 HBO specials. I actually knew George before I even worked with him. I actually met George before I even was in the business. I came out here, went to the studios, and we wound up at a Tonight Show. George happened to be on the show. And I saw him in the hallway, and I approached him and introduced myself. And he said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I want to come out to California one day, but I wrote a piece of material called Captain Catholic. He was amused. (laughs) And he said, what is Captain Catholic? Captain Catholic is a hero. He has a cape and a mask on the color of the Vatican. He's got CC on his chest. It's a kid's show. It's Captain Catholic time. It's Captain Catholic time. Captain comes to you. Be good and God bless you. Captain Catholic, boom, boom, boom. Out comes you in this cape and you do the genuflection exercises. And then you have products to sell, which is spray and pray holy water, and um, Captain Catholic cereal, which is just hosts. And he said, stop. (laughs) He says, stop. He says, first of all, (laughs) I love this. It probably will never get on television. But when you come out to California, contact me. I was 20, uh, 23, 24, whatever I was. And I came out, and I was working on the last Steve Allen show. And I started booking George. So I kind of struck up a relationship with George, and then booked him on the Midnight Special. And then I hadn't seen him for a while. 
and I'm driving down Sunset. This is uh, 84, 85, I can't quite remember. And it said George Carlin at the Wadsworth. And I bought a ticket. And I went to see the show, and I went backstage. And he was happy to see me. He pulled me out in the hallway. He said, you want to do my next HBL special? And I said, be honored. And I did 10 in a row. And I never thought I would do two or three. I get a call from Jerry. We're doing a show called, it's going to be called Jammin' in New York. It's going to be called Back in Town. What am I doing in New Jersey? That was all, the title was always there. It was never a surprise. And they never changed. This is the only time it changed for obvious reasons. I loved the title, kind of like when a lot of people die. Because I couldn't wait. <laughs> you know, with a title like that, you can't wait. My first instinct was obvious. There's going to be about people that we, you know, that suck, that we're glad they're dead. But then I said, nah, he's not going to do that. That's, you know, that's, he's not going to do that. We had pretty much fixed what we were going to do. And me and Bruce Ryan had trying to design some kind of set. And what's interesting is the graveyard set that wound up with, and you know, life is worth losing, the one in the, the beacon was the one we probably was, we were going to use on People Die. So that was thrown out immediately when, you know, when the horrific news came about 9-11. I thought they were going to cancel the special at first. I really did. But then when he called me up, we're changing the title. I guess we're going to have to change the title. I didn't find out till later it was going to be called Complaints and Grievances. And Bruce and I didn't have time to conceive a set for that. So we did the construction pipes, you know, in New York, when they're having construction, you walk in. And that great poster, and we put it as billboards, and we kind of put the, the set together at last minute. That show, to me, will always be special because of that event. But then after a while, when George walked on stage, it was another HBO special, and we all kicked in gear. The audience was great. I think they wanted, they were looking for some relief. I think they were grateful that he came. We were climbing in this fog, and I remember it not, it not being a, a, a joyful experience, but I think we were, it was a grateful experience. Hey, look, he's from New York. It's his hometown. They fucked on his turf. Maybe people didn't understand at the time, but it's pretty historic that a major figure would have the balls to do a comedy special this close to a horrific event, make it funny, entertaining, and political. You know, I, I think that that's incredible. But that's George. It's just amazing to me now uh, when I hear it after the longest time. Uh, what an incredible piece this is. It really is. It's right up there, boy. And what a beautiful message at the end. I remember that very clearly. I miss this guy, don't we? Now, I want to do a little something here. To take a liberty. Uh, this is a piece I've never read before out loud. What I do is I, I write things real hard, write them, 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 write them. Then I start doing them around the house from a piece of paper, and I start changing a little bit, and then I print it out again, print it out again, print it out again. Finally, I start reading it to the audience, and then I start to memorize it, and I have it on cards after I read it, and then after the cards, I got it from memory. Three of the four, three of the four, three of the things I did here tonight, I was reading when I came here two weeks ago. So this is a quick process. I want to try this on you. I'm trying it on you. I admit that. I don't give a shit if you like it or not, because I'm going to do it. And I'm not worried about the audience. The audience doesn't make shit. Okay? Right next All right? This is going to be for the ending of the show and, and that's called I Kind of Like It When a Lot of People Die. And this piece of material is called I Kind of Like It When a Lot of People Die. But you have to go, you have to realize I'm reading it's going to lose a lot of the value. I just want to hear the words out loud, okay? Remember when I said earlier I like to stop at traffic accidents and look at the bodies? Well, it's true. I like it. I like any kind of tragedy or disaster, you know? Love fucking disasters and tragedies. People always think I'm kidding, but I'm not. It's true. I love it. All these things, explosions, fires, plane crashes, train wrecks, cave-ins. I love them all, and the bigger the better. Because i got to tell you, folks, and I'll be not going to go soft on you here. The truth is... I kind of like it when a lot of people die. You know what I mean? When a whole lot of people get killed. A couple of hundred, a couple of thousand, a couple of hundred thousand. I like it. It makes me feel good. But I want you to know I really mean this. It's hard to convince people you really mean something like this. Especially when you're a comedian. They say, well, he's just trying to get laughs. No, not making a joke. I swear to God, I fucking mean it. I mean it with all my heart. I really like it when a lot of people die. I can't help it. It just makes me feel good. 
And I know some people think these kind of thoughts are ghoulish and demented and sick, but I know they're not. And I know these feelings are normal and quite common. I know that a lot of you feel the same way, but you're afraid to admit it because society has told you that nice people don't take pleasure in mass death, but you're wrong because I think mass death is terrific and I'm a really nice fucking guy. <laughs> And not only is mass death terrific, I think it's really exciting. I used to think that was the only thing I liked about it, that it was exciting, you know. Big disasters are exciting, and the more dead there are, the more exciting it is. And then I realized, no, it's not the excitement I like. It's the dead people. That's the part I really enjoy. You know, the best thing we can hear on television, we interrupt this program. You know the worst thing? No one was hurt. Uh, I think that everybody got out alive brings me down, because I really like a high death count, and I don't care who gets killed, I don't give a shit, as long as it's not me, as long as it's not somebody close to me, although to tell you the truth, if it's a really good disaster, the people close to me, they're on their own, they just have to work it out, that's tough shit, some people say, well, that's all very amusing, George, but you'd feel a whole lot different if there was really a big disaster and one of your loved ones got killed, and I think, no, I wouldn't. Not really. Maybe it would be a little less fun than usual, but if it was a really good disaster, it might be okay. As long as a lot of other people died, too. You know, strangers, lots of them. Because the truth is, folks, the only thing I care about is fun. That's all. Entertainment. That's all I want. A good show. The way I look at it, that's the only reason I'm here on Earth. For the entertainment. Philosophers say, why are we here? And I tell them, I'm here for the fun. What else could it be? What else? I'm not here to grow crops. I'm not here to build bridges. I'm not here to atone for my sins or help my fellow man. And I'm certainly not here to worry and suffer and sweat. I'm here to see the fucking show. To me, the world is one big theatrical production, a long-running show, a big round ball revolving around a big round sun, theater in the round. It's all a big show. And when you're born, they give you a free ticket. And I say, bring on the show. Enjoy the entertainment. Enjoy it now. There's no second show. Especially the big disasters. And that's what I like the most. Big natural disasters. Doesn't matter what it is either. Tornado, hurricane, earthquake, blizzard, typhoon, sandstorm, cave-in, volcano, heat Heat wave, cold wave, tidal wave, monsoon, flood, drought, forest fire, mudslide, avalanche, epidemic, pandemic, famine, plague, shit. You know something? I'll even settle for some food poisoning at a church picnic. I don't care. It doesn't fucking matter as long as a lot of people die. And those are just the natural disasters, the things that we can't prevent. I also like the man-made disasters, the things we cause. Riots, revolutions, terrorism, slaughter, massacres, atrocities, assassinations, mass suicide, self-mutilation, dismemberment. Explosions, crashes, train wrecks, arson, chemical spills, nuclear meltdowns, war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, crimes against nature. You know something? I'll even settle for a runaway merry-go-round. A runaway merry-go-round, spinning out of control, 60 miles an hour, 200 revolutions a minute, children flying off one by one, and they all land in a big pile right in front of the fun house, right next to the cotton candy, because to me it's all big fun. It's all a fun house. I don't give a shit. It's all fun. What is there to care about? What is there to care about besides friends and family and being in love, being crazy in love and eating a fucking hot dog? Nothing else matters. It's all bullshit. The rest of it is all bullshit. And the more you think it matters, the more power you give it. The more power you give it, the more it takes control of you. And the more it takes control of you, the less fun you have. And the more you find yourself running around the shopping mall looking for a dust buster and a salad shooter, trying to find a sale so you can use your credit card and get some extra mileage points, so you can get a cheap flight to Cancun with all the other people who aren't having any fucking fun and get ripped off and sunburned and drink too much so you can throw up in the airport just before you get back on the plane. Building up mileage points again and continue not having any fun. Folks, you gotta have fun. That's why I like it when a lot of people die. That's why I like big disasters. And no matter what the original disaster is, I always hope that at least the complications that are worse than the original problem, worse and worse and worse. Like if a huge 72 inch water main ruptures in the downtown section of a city and water rushes through the streets and basements, causing power failures that knock out all the traffic lights, and a monstrous traffic jam ties up the entire city, and emergency vehicles can't get through, and sick people be begin to die, and the people who aren't sick begin to panic and try to escape the city, and a lot of them get trampled to death, and at the same time, one when one of those month-long global warming heat waves comes along and starts killing old people and babies, and there's still no electrical power for air conditioning and no water for sanitation, so contagious diseases begin to break out, like cholera and taf typhus and dysentery, and all the old people and babies become infected and start to die, and the infected people become deranged and demented, and they start storming the hospitals demanding medicines, and the hospitals 
hand hand in the casualty so the sick and infected people start rioting and looting and burning their clothing in the street and the flames drive them crazy and they start killing people and lighting hundreds of buildings on fire and since there's no water the entire city begins to burn and the natural gas lines start exploding and the people who aren't sick yet get angry and start shooting the sick people sick people and hanging them from lab posts and looting homes and stores and fornicating and defecating in the streets some of them actually butt fucking on the steps of city hall and then then, as the whole city burns out of control, huge sparks are carried away by the wind, and the suburbs and countryside catch fire, and the wind ignites huge brush fires several counties wide that come together into one big fire and spread to the forest, and the forest burn out of control, developing into a huge firestorm traveling 200 miles an hour, consuming everything in its path as the western United States burns completely out of control, creating a coast-to-coast -coast smoke cloud that chokes millions of animals and old people, and the prevailing winds push the fire farther and farther east, igniting the central plains where the prairies and grasslands catch fire and burn uncontrollably and then pushed by the violent winds the grass fires leap the Mississippi River enveloping the eastern forest and a huge thermal updraft develops that sucked up into the jet stream causing a hemispheric incendiary macro system a mega firestorm that begins to rapidly alter the molecular structure of the magnetosphere South Pole suddenly reverse, and huge sparks and thunderbolts start shooting out of the poles, and the ozone layer catches fire, which combined with El Nino rapidly raises the temperature of the oceans, completely changing the global climate, and all the ice caps and glaciers melt in less than two weeks, raising the level of the oceans by 300 feet, and flooding all the coastal places and low-lying regions, completely fucking up places like San Diego. And a lot of people die. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh,